for uh, questions to the First Minister. And very pleased to say I'm not sure this is your last, but uh, you're always very welcome. And uh, we will start. Uh, we just uh, uh, inform members that question uh, 14 has been withdrawn. And I call Bronwyn McGahan. Question 1. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, well, I will ask uh, Junior Minister Mrs. Emma Pengelly to answer that question. Mr. Speaker, officials from our department met with Pablo de Grief, the UN Special Rapporteur on Truth, Justice, Reparation and Guarantees of Non-Recurrence on the 11th of November 2015. The purpose of the visit was to offer an objective assessment of the various initiatives undertaken to deal with the legacies of the Troubles. Discussions focused on the holistic approach currently being undertaken to improve services for victims and survivors here. These focused on the victim support and individual needs programs and our department's ongoing collaborative design program, which we have undertaken in conjunction with the Commission for Victims and Survivors and the Victims and Survivors Service. This program aims to ensure a level of service provision which better meets the needs of victims and survivors. The significant progress made by the programme and the positive feedback received to date was discussed, along with key strands of work being taken forward under the Stormont House Agreement in relation to advocacy, a pension for those severely physically injured and the establishment of a mental trauma service. The implementation of Together Building a United Community strategy was also discussed. These discussions included the recently published Good Relations Indicators and the application of an outcome-based approach to monitoring and evaluation. Mr De Grief will now prepare a report on his findings from the visit, which will be presented to the Human Rights Council in September 2016. Our department will give his advice and recommendations due consideration. Thank you. And I call Ms McGahan for a supplementary. Gourmet uh, and I thank the Minister for her response and I want to take this opportunity to wish you all the best in your new role. Considering that the Special Rapporteur acknowledged in his preliminary recommendations that it is easy to use national security as a, a blanket term, could I ask the Minister what steps will be taken to establish mechanisms for dealing with the past that deliver full disclosure of truth that victims and families deserve? As the member will be aware, the issue of national security was the subject of considerable discussion throughout the recent uh, talks process. I think in all of these issues there is a, a matter of compromise uh, to be had. On one hand, families want access to truth and information, and in particular, many, many hundreds of families have contacted me and the Office of First Minister in relation to their quest for justice. However, on the other side of that, there needs to be uh, protections in relation to national security. Just uh, this week, it has become clear that at least seven uh, attempts of attacks across the UK this year alone have been foiled by our security and intelligence services. Therefore, the techniques deployed do need to be protected. All citizens across the United Kingdom need to have the protections afforded by the national security protections at a state level. So a compromise does need to be reached, but it has to go both ways. Thank you. And I call Mr. Edwin Putz. Well, we move on then. I call Mr. Alec Edwin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And could I uh, wish the uh, First Minister uh, good health and good times whenever he decides to uh, depart from this place. Uh, could I ask um, uh, the, the junior minister, on Friday afternoon, the uh, new leader of the SDLP, Colin Eastwood, wrote to the British government and copied the Irish government, recommending that the revised draft legacy bill that no doubt the British government has in its possession should be published, not least, uh, to inform victims and survivors in a way that they may not have been informed since Stormont House. Given the comments of the First Minister on Friday evening, does the uh, First Minister and Junior Minister endorse the recommendation that the Leader of the SDLP put to the Secretary of State? 
Well, Mr. Speaker, the member will be very much aware of the position of the, uh, of the First Minister in relation to this matter. The First Minister has just recently made clear that during the talks process, um, the DUP supported the proposition by the British and Irish governments that the entire legacy section should be made available to victims and survivors. And in addition, the very substantive piece of legislation drafted at Westminster on behalf of uh, the parties here should also be published. You're going to call Mr. Adrian Cochran Watson. Uh, can I also wish the First Minister every success in the future when he decides to formally stand down? Could I ask the junior minister, does, the, does she agree with, uh, with myself that not just the state, but also groups have to be honest about their actions and the, the consequences that their actions have brought about to ensure an ongoing occurrence? Uh, absolutely. We have made it um, very clear throughout this process that victims deserve justice, victims deserve truth. It is very, very sad that victims have had to wait so long in order to get that justice and truth. But throughout this process, and in fact not just this process, but throughout the Stormont House negotiations last Christmas, throughout the Haas uh, negotiations, the Office of First Minister have been absolutely at the forefront of fighting for justice and truth for victims and survivors. I think we would, uh, across this House, um, support calls for those who have information in relation to any um, event in the past, any act of terrorism in the past, to come forward and to tell people what information that they have, and importantly to tell the PSNI to allow victims and survivors to get the closure and justice they rightly deserve. Thank you. And I call Mr. Jim Allister. Yes, can I join in wishing the First Minister of Ong and healthy retirement? The UN Rapporteur uh, is very clear, it seems, on the need for the truth. Is the minister, does the Minister think that she and the First Minister are getting the truth from their partner Sinn Féin in their continuing denial of even the existence of the IRA? and its controlling army council? And doesn't that situation make a nonsense of the suggestion that there's now going to be a process to disband paramilitary organizations if Sinn Féin persist, as far as the Republican movement is concerned, there's nothing to disband? Well, Mr. Speaker, um, again, the First Minister uh, has been very, very clear in relation to these matters that people need to come forward, they need to tell the truth, they need to give that information. But although there is that quest for knowledge uh, by all of us in relation to these matters, the focus of this question, and I think the focus of my comments today, is the fact that the need for truth and justice for victims and survivors in particular is absolutely acute. We know that there are people across Northern Ireland that hold information that could give justice and truth to those victims and survivors. So today I would like the focus to be on their cause and to reiterate and emphasise that if anybody has that information, come forward to the PSNI and give that closure to victims and survivors. And I call Mr Chris Little. Question number two, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, can I thank uh, members for their, their kind personal comments. Uh, our 16-week public consultation uh, instigated much discussion and elicited, uh, elicited many opinions from right across society. Uh, after the analysis of those contributions was completed, the strategy was revised to take account of the consultation responses, and this has been considered and commented on by executive ministers. Once the strategy has been agreed by the executive, we would hope to publish it in a matter of weeks. The racial equality strategy establishes a framework for action by government departments and others to tackle racial inequalities and to open up opportunity for all to eradicate racism and hate crime, and along with the together building a united community policy to promote good relations and social cohesion. Full and effective implementation of this strategy will only be achieved by departments working together in partnership with the voluntary and community sector and other elements of civic society. And comes Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the First Minister for his response. And despite uh, disagreeing with him fundamentally on many issues, can I too extend sincere good wishes uh, for his uh, uh, departure from this assembly when he decides to do so? Uh, can I ask the First Minister then, 
In light of uh, recent serious racist attacks, petrol bombs, cars being torched, homes attacked, residents assaulted in Ballykeel, Ballymena and my own constituency of East Belfast, and indeed the desire of the majority of people in our community to see a united community, is the inordinate delay in delivery of a racial equality strategy and a refugee integration strategy not an indictment on OFM, DFM? And would he agree that the work to ensure our black and minority ethnic uh, members of our community have the same safety, inclusion and opportunity as anyone else in our community is work that still urgently has to be done? Well, I think that just leaves out uh, several factors which uh, the, the member presumably doesn't want uh, the House and beyond to be aware of, because of course we do have a community safety strategy for Northern Ireland which sets out the executive's commitment to tackle all forms of uh, hate crime. Uh, and the strategy has uh, associated action plans, uh, including a dedicated hate crime action plan, which details the measures which a range of departments and relevant agencies are, are taking forward, including uh, officials in OFM, DFM, uh, who are represented uh, on the uh, Department of Justice's hate crime delivery group, which was established to support the delivery of that uh, strategy. Uh, the member also seems to think that somehow the delivery of a strategy is in itself the answer to uh, these kind of uh, uh, issues, which I hope the, the House will join with me uh, in absolutely condemning. Uh, this kind of activity is completely uh, unacceptable. Uh, and I think that if anybody puts themselves in the, the place uh, of someone uh, in uh, our community who has come from uh, foreign parts, they will know the degree of isolation that uh, there is, the uh, lack of uh, backup networks that are available uh, to them, uh, and uh, I hope that everybody remembers that they should be treating uh, others as they would like to be treated themselves. Uh, however, let's not get tied down in the process of this strategy. The strategy has been out for some considerable time for public consultation. It has been a very wide consultation with uh, a very considerable response uh, that has uh, been received. Uh, that has now reached the stage where the revision uh, is before ministers. Uh, and as the, the strategy uh, itself in draft form talks about it being a strategy for 2015 to 2025, I would hope that it will be published within a very short uh, period of time. You and I call Ms. Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to thank the First Minister for his earlier answer. And if I may, Mr. Speaker, like many, pay tribute to the First Minister for what is likely to be his last question time and thank him for his years of selfless service to the people of Northern Ireland and for his friendship and mentoring to me and my daughters. Um, can I ask the First Minister if he can outline the role of the Crisis Fund in helping minority ethnic individuals in dealing with emergency situations? First of all, can I, I thank my uh, good friend uh, for her kind uh, comments. Uh, as I indicated in the, the first uh, response that I, I gave, that traditionally people who come from uh, ethnic minorities uh, have fewer and uh, weaker network support, and that does require from time to time that they have to, to rely on the, the crisis fund for support. Uh, the crisis for, uh, fund is, of course, to, to give help to those who are destitute, uh, and uh, I believe last year the fund distributed about uh, £36,600, and this year has £100,000 uh, available uh, to be used. Uh, some people have asked whether the crisis fund will be used uh, for uh, Syrian uh, refugees. The answer to that is, while technically uh, it could be, I think the provision of the scheme under which uh, they would be coming is such that they should not be destitute uh, and therefore would not uh, need to fall back on that fund. Thank you. And I call Mr John Dallet. Uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I uh, thank the Minister for his answer and of course, like everyone else in this House, wish him all the best for the future, particularly in good health. The Minister will agree with me that those involved in hate crimes are not really bothered about strategies or plans or all the other things that we get involved in, but they might well understand uh, a change in the hate laws which would make it very clear that those who get involved in this kind of criminal activity will spend a long time behind bars where the wider community and particularly minority communities are safe. What's the Minister's views on 
change in the hate laws? Well, I do agree with the, the, the member that uh, certainly the, the people who are involved in this kind of activity uh, probably would have difficulty even in reading a strategy. Uh, the reality, of course, is that the, the strategy is for government departments and others to coordinate their efforts to ensure that we as a community unite against this kind of activity, speak out against this kind of activity, and in that context I think a strategy is valuable. In terms of toughening up the laws, I think there's a wide range of areas in our society where there is a requirement to have a very severe deterrent. Uh, to those who think that this is a suitable thing to be involved in. Uh, and uh, I would certainly be happy if a review of the length of sentences and punishments and sanctions uh, in relation to, to race hate and indeed uh, other types of hate crime uh, would be reviewed. Thank you. And I call Mr Chris Hazard. Can I call you Kesha Retreat at a whole question number three? Mr Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Mrs Emma Pengeli to answer this question. Mr Speaker, we have accepted the Court's judgment on our statutory obligations to provide an anti-poverty strategy. Although I was disappointed that the Court did not give more weight to the significant range of actions that we have been taking forward to address poverty, social exclusion and deprivation. In particular, the innovative and exciting work that we have taken forward on our Delivering Social Change Framework and to develop an outcomes focus on addressing poverty and the consequences of poverty. Through the Executive's Delivering Social Change programme, we have committed over £100 million to reduce poverty and the consequences of living in areas of deprivation. We have currently spent over £27 million on our Delivering Social Change signature projects, including contributing significantly to the projects jointly funded with Atlantic Philanthropies, in total worth almost £60 million over this and the next three years. In all this work, we have focused strategically on improving outcomes across a range of poverty and deprivation measures, including health, education, and developing the economy to help improve the lives of those in poverty. I am disappointed that the Court took a very narrow view on the definition of what constitutes a strategy, but we are working to address the concerns of the Court and we will bring forward proposals in the coming months following appropriate consultation and deliberation. I call Mr. Hazard for a supplement. I can thank the Minister for her answer thus far. Can I ask the Minister what effect uh, the changes to the Child Poverty Act proposed by the British Government's Welfare Reform and Work Bill will have in tackling child poverty here in the North? Well, Mr. Speaker, we have had many discussions over the last five years, particularly within the context of delivering social change, um, in relation to what the most appropriate measures should be. The child poverty legislation, when it was brought in, um, kept many of the child poverty measurements. Those measurements are entirely income-based measurements. So they don't measure, for example, um, where there is poverty in education, in opportunity, in aspiration. They simply measure how much income a family has. Um, it also didn't take into account, for example, a, a range of measures by the executive to keep family household income uh, outgoings down. So, I think we were always of the view that there were some flaws in the way that the measurements uh, were uh, carried out. The uh, Conservative government have indicated very clearly that they are looking at these issues. We, we, it isn't um, clear at this stage the detail of that. But what I would say is that our outcomes-based um, approach looks much wider than those income-based uh, measurements within the legislation. And I suspect that uh, we will continue to do that. If you look at our indicators around education, health, a whole range of, of other issues. It's not just those uh, measurements. So regardless of whether those measurements change or they remain largely the same, the Northern Ireland Executive will continue to look at poverty right across the spectrum, not just income poverty. Thank you. And I'll call Mr Gordon Lyons. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome the Junior Minister to her new role and uh, wish her well. And we will also want to uh, join with others in these benches and uh, thank the First Minister for all of his years of service, not only to our party, um, but also to our country. We wish him well uh, in his retirement. In terms of uh, poverty, 
Can the junior minister uh, give us her view on the proposition referenced by some uh, that spatial deprivation should be the main way of allocating funding on objective need? Thank you. you know, Mr Speaker, I do believe that there has been a great deal of misunderstanding in relation to the court judgment. The court judgment did not examine whether or not the Office of First and Deputy First Minister and the Northern Ireland Executive were fulfilling their obligations in relation to objective need, but rather whether the work that we had carried out uh, constituted a strategy. The judgment was absolutely clear that it would not go into the detail of objective need and the definition uh, of that. There, so there has been some confusion. Um, I welcome the opportunity to clarify that. There is a proposition out there that all of our programmes should be rolled out in relation to spatial need. So depending on whether you live in a particular area or another area, you should get a range of services. However, that is not what objective need means. In fact, the Northern Ireland Executive rules out the vast majority of its programmes to address poverty and deprivation in relation to objective need, but that objective need pertains either to the individual or the family. So if you've got a health need, it's your personal objective medical needs that are taken into account. If you're unemployed, it doesn't matter if you live in Cumber or Rich Hill or in North Belfast. You get objectively support from the government for that. So the vast majority of our services that we roll out through the Northern Atlantic Executive is on objective need, but it's not necessarily on spatial objective need. That said, uh, targeting programmes in relation to spatial uh, deprivation are also, is also very, very important because what uh, is clear from our research is that where there are a range of social deprivation factors that come into play, um, and my colleague from the uh, Department of Social Development will be very aware of this, that where there's a range of factors that come into play, the outcomes can be particularly bad for young people. So there are a range of programmes through the Department of Social Development and from OFMDFM we will, we will continue to roll out in relation to spatial deprivation. But I do think there's a lot of misunderstanding in relation to objective need. There does need to be greater clarification about that. And hopefully we will take the opportunity of developing this strategy to give clarity in relation to this matter. And thank you for that detailed answer, but there is a two-minute rule which I will <laughs> remind you about now. And could I call Mr Alvin McGuinness? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and could I um, uh, wish the junior minister well in her new role and look forward to working with her? And could I wish the first minister well in his uh, retirement? Um, could I ask, Mr. Speaker, in view of the fact that there is uh, a purported a commitment to an anti-poverty strategy by the First and Deputy First Minister's Office. Given the fact that they have handed over welfare back to Westminster, and given the fact that uh, the prospect of the introduction by the British Government directly here of a benefits uh, freeze and also a benefits cap, uh, an individual benefits cap of about 20,000, given that, does that not sit uneasily with any purported anti poverty strategy. Mr Speaker, one of the, the key things that uh, has emerged from our work in relation to social change um, over the course of the last five years, and I think the Office of First and Deputy First Minister took a deliberate um, change in our approach in relation to these issues. Prior to that, we collated uh, significant strategies. We went around all of the departments, asked departments what they were doing in relation to anti-poverty activities. We produced that and we monitored progress against that. And at the end of that process, I wasn't particularly convinced we'd actually achieved anything. So in and around uh, four to five years ago, we changed um, our approach to this quite fundamentally to look at, for example, delivery frameworks, look at targeting specific actions to address uh, poor outcomes. And we also engaged with a, a wide range of academics, experts, stakeholders uh, in relation to these matters. And what was very clear from that work is that income poverty need not lead to bad outcomes. And that is very much at the heart of our delivering social change agenda. The Northern Ireland Executive has been uh, absolutely keen to keep as much money as possible within uh, families' pockets 
um, didn't introduce and refused to introduce water rates, for example, trying to keep costs down for uh, average households. But in addition, we looked at a range of initiatives to try to address where <coughs> poverty um, was influencing poorer outcomes. So, for example, rather than just concentrate on the income of the family, we looked at the education project under delivering social change. So, we introduced the numeracy and literacy scheme. 16,000 young people across Northern Ireland had a benefit from that. It didn't affect the income of the family, but what was very clear that after the first year of operation, 6.3% increase in GCSEs, uh, A to C, 5 GCSEs, A to C, um, in non-grammar school pupils. So there's a direct outcome based on an anti-poverty intervention, which is not necessarily income-based. Thank you. I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Mr. Speaker, and I also wish the First Minister and the Junior Minister well in the future. Does the Minister agree that the Minister is the Department, and therefore the fact that a junior OFM DFM Minister welcomed the court ruling against OFM DFM either proves a poor understanding of the workings of government or a very frank admission of the dysfunctionality of OFM DFM? Well, I, have, I can only speak for myself, and I have to say, you know, I've been clear that we have accepted the court's judgment. I have to say I was very disappointed in it. The court specifically looked at what the definition of a strategy was. And within OFM-DFM, we have the child poverty strategy. We had adopted the architecture and key principles of a lifetime opportunities, which was the anti-poverty strategy. And we rolled out the deliver and social change delivery framework. And along with that, we had uh, the six signature projects spending, as I mentioned, £27 million on those projects. I honestly believe those projects have made a very fundamental difference to people's lives. I mentioned the 16,000 young people who have had the numeracy and literacy support, 3,300 families supported um, through the family support hubs, 650 families supported by supporting parenting um, signature project. So, I honestly do believe that there's been significant work done. I think that's valuable work. I think this is the right approach. Rather than have a strategy that doesn't necessarily achieve uh, anything, we have a delivery framework that is delivering changes on the ground and producing results in relation to outcomes. Um, I have indicated I'm disappointed in the court's judgment, but we have uh, accepted that judgment and we will now move to uh, bring all of that work together and produce a, a strategy. Thank you. And I call Mr. John McAllister. Mr. Speaker, question number four. Mr. Speaker, it's not often that the person who is asking uh, a question so early on is not sure whether it's going to be reached. The promotion of Northern Ireland internationally <laughs> is a key strategic aim of the Executive's international relations strategy. We recognise the crucial role that enhancing our international credibility plays in securing its objectives. Our international priorities are focused on developing working relations in the United States, Europe and the People's Republic of China. The three executive offices in Washington, Brussels and Beijing continue to play a significant role in this international outreach. Over the past 10 years, the Washington Bureau's nurturing of important relations with senior U.S. government officials has been integral to invest Northern Ireland's unprecedented success in attracting U.S. investment into Northern Ireland. The Brussels office continues to influence European policy and legislation on behalf of the Executive. In 2014-15, it hosted seven ministerial visits and some 60 events with almost 2,500 visitors. To put this in a financial context, the Executive has drawn down £72.7 million of competitive EU funds in the last three years. Our relationship with China is still in its early stages, but we are already starting to see positive results. We recently welcomed three senior Chinese government ministers and four economic delegations to Belfast. A number of government-to-government -government agreements in areas of economic cooperation, education and cultural promotion have been signed. Progress continues to be made in securing market access for our local agricultural products. Over recent months, we have hosted the Australian High Commissioner and the Ambassadors of Mexico, France and Finland to Northern Ireland. These representational meetings develop important diplomatic relations with other governments and contribute to our wider international aims. Thank you. And I call Mr. John McAllister for a supplement. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, like colleagues, wish the First Minister well, and certainly in his dealings with me, um, he was nothing uh, but courteous, and I appreciate that very much, and wish him and his family well in his uh, retirement. Could the First Minister, no doubt, would know of the impact of instability that would have, and the difficulty in promoting uh, Northern Ireland internationally on that. Would he agree with me also that you cannot, we cannot go through another mandate um, with an executive looking in with such instability and an executive at odds with itself? First of all, can I thank the, the, the member for his kind remarks, uh, and I agree with him entirely. Uh, I was speaking to uh, a large group of businessmen just uh, towards the end of last week, uh, and while they were full of the, the issue about the reduction in the level of corporation tax and having set a date and a rate. I told them that uh, by far the most important aspect for business in the agreement that uh, had been reached was the fact that there was to be stability in Northern Ireland. That is key for business decision making. Uh, and uh, that's why I think we are right to call it a, a fresh start. Uh, I think business people know better that, than most that the environment within which they have to operate is key. So I agree with the, the member entirely. Uh, I, I believe that the, the foundations have been laid in that agreement. There are no issues that should trip the executive up in taking the necessary uh, positions that they need to in order to have a sustainable budget and to be able to take decisions on behalf of the people that we all represent. Thank you. And uh, that brings us to the end of the period for listed questions. And we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Mr. Sean Lynch. I'll get the can call you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the Minister agree that any attempt by George Osborne to use the big lotteries funding to supplement the proposed cuts in department spending should be resisted? Well, I, I do. Uh, my uh, my alarm bells went off when I uh, heard the speculation that the, the Chancellor may move in this uh, direction. Uh, I think those of us who were uh, active in politics, and probably many who were not uh, at the time of the introduction of uh, lottery funding, uh, recognise whatever their view might have been on the issue of uh, having a, a national lottery, that uh, the, the key ingredient was additionality, that it should not be used by government as a, a taxation method, as a way of uh, funding various uh, necessary projects. Uh, so I, I do I agree entirely uh, with the, the member, uh, and I'm pretty sure that uh, the, the Deputy First Minister and I uh, would be agreeable to make our views known, and I hope the views of this uh, whole House uh, to uh, DCMS uh, before any announcement is made. Thank you. And I call Mr Lynch for a supplement. Yeah, go and quick as Donara and Frag I want to thank the First Minister for his answer. Uh, does he agree that this could have a hugely negative impact on the community and voluntary sector and damage many projects that are underway at this moment in time? Well, unquestionably uh, it will. Uh, even in the, the last year, uh, the, the big lottery has, uh, I think, made about uh, 500 awards uh, in Northern Ireland, totalling about four and a half million pounds. But on top of that, uh, they make uh, grants and assist uh, in, in granting about 800 organisations in Northern Ireland. And those range from community uh, groups uh, right through to uh, some of the, the more strategic partnerships. Uh, and I think most of us know that uh, there was an intention on the, the part of the, the big lottery uh, at the beginning of next year. Uh, to have a new program on people in communities uh, and uh, if there is a change to the uh, awards that are they are permitted to, to make it is likely that people in communities uh, project could be the first victim thank you and I call Mr Paul Given thank you Mr Speaker and can I associate myself with the warm tributes that have been paid to the first minister uh, Peter Robinson transcends three generations of my family like him my grandfather was a founding member, and I want to thank him for the legacy that he has left us and left Northern Ireland more secure than ever before within the Union. And ca can I thank him too personally for the support that he has given to me and also uh, the opportunity has been a privilege to serve with him in this Assembly. Uh, most recently, his agreement um, this week or last week uh, has included 
the financial package from the United K uh, Kingdom government. Um, could he offer some assessment in respect of that financial uh, package? Well, uh, I'm grateful for the, the comments. Uh, it's been somewhat of a, a surreal uh, experience. It's almost as if one was dead and listening to uh, the, the uh, obituary, but uh, I am, I hope, uh, still very much uh, alive and will remain so for uh, some time to, to come. Uh, I suppose the, the reference to three generations is another way of saying, Peter, you're very old. Uh, however, uh, on the, the issue of the finances of the uh, Stormont Agreement and Implementation Plan, I think we should first of all remember uh, that uh, this was uh, our uh, second bite uh, at uh, this uh, cherry because uh, we did get previously a significant uh, financial package. Some people, I think, unkindly and wrongly referred to it as being a bit of smoke and mirrors because of uh, the two billion spending plan. Uh, and it was a substantial amount of money, and it wasn't all uh, direct uh, funding because it did have uh, that element of uh, borrowing. Uh, what some people, probably those who didn't have a great deal uh, of financial knowledge, probably didn't realise was that even though it was borrowing, it was uh, immediately making available to us real cash because of the uh, spending savings that we were having as a result particularly of the voluntary uh, exit scheme. Uh, this new package uh, amounts to uh, about uh, £560 million, uh, and uh, it ranges, I think, particularly across uh, those issues that will help the PSNI on security and paramilitary uh, matters. Uh, it also has uh, the invest to save element uh, for fraud and error. Uh, the, the modest figure that has been put down uh, for uh, our savings in that has been £150 million. Pounds. I have to say that the earlier assessments that we had from DSD and from DFP were considerably more than that, but time alone will tell what uh, that turns out to, to be. Uh, all in all, uh, this makes a substantial additional element of, of funding available uh, to the executive. It allowed us uh, at our last executive meeting to clear the, uh, the, the paper that the finance minister brought to us uh, in relation to uh, the uh, November uh, monitoring round, uh, and uh, it's very clear that without any uh, difficulty, we will be able to make ends uh, meet this year. Thank you, Mr. Given, for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, First Minister. In the run-up to the agreement, the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party made apocalyptic claims that we were mortgaging our children's future to the tune of some half a billion pounds. Um, in light of the uh, reality in the financial package around this agreement, would he like to make any comment in respect of Mr Nesmith's economic analysis? <laughs> this, uh, it's a bit of an open goal, really, to, to, to pick out this one. Uh, no, I think I, I'll resist the, the temptation. Uh, sufficient, uh, sufficient to say that uh, while the, uh, the, the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party was uh, absolutely sure that uh, this would be borrowing and that uh, our children and children's children would have to pay for uh, decades to, to come. Not one penny of this additional funding is borrowing. Uh, it is all money available to the uh, executive that our children will not have to, to pay for. Uh, what our children would have to pay for uh, is the futility of those who cannot see that the future of Northern Ireland rests on us having a shared future moving forward together, trying to get uh, stability in Northern Ireland uh, and making sure that we have a, an era of peace and prosperity for all of those that we represent. Yeah. Thank you. And I call Ms. Rosalind <laughs> I thank the Minister, First Minister, for his answers, and I also wish him well for the future. And could I ask uh, the First Minister, would he agree with me that the Commission on Flags, Identity, Culture and Tradition should give meaningful consideration to the inclusion of our cultures and identities in public symbols, similar to that being discussed uh, currently in New Zealand? Well, I am grateful for the, the Member's uh, remarks. Uh, within the uh, Agreement and Implementation Plan, uh, it is agreed that uh, the, uh, the Commission should be set up 
uh, before I think it is March of next year, but that uh, the advertising for it uh, should occur before the end of uh, December. Uh, the purpose of that group is to go around Northern Ireland to speak directly to people, to open up a debate, to have a conversation uh, with the, the people of Northern Ireland about those uh, issues which have dogged our society for so long. Uh, and I think we do need to have a better understanding uh, of uh, the, the position that we each have. There are differences, and they are deeply seated differences, in Northern Ireland about uh, identity and culture and other matters. Uh, and the way to, to break down those differences is to ensure that we have an understanding. So I, I hope that those uh, meetings and engagements that will take place will do so uh, in a, a, a positive spirit, uh, where people are indicating how important their positions are rather than trying to live off bringing somebody else's tradition and background down. Uh, let's uh, try and have the, the best of our two traditions rather than enmity between the two traditions. Thank you, Ms. McCorley, for supplement. Gurmaya, <coughs> good. Uh, uh, the Minister said that those engagements should be uh, positive. Would you agree also that it is very important that they are inclusive and respectful as well? Well, they will be meaningless if they are not inclusive. Uh, there is no advantage in going out to, to get people's views and to cut off uh, any particular uh, interest just simply because they don't accord with the, the views of someone uh, in the, the, the panel that's looking at it. Yes, it must be inclusive, uh, and uh, if we are to benefit truly from it, uh, I think we do need to uh, respect and understand other people's views uh, and what hope would there be uh, if uh, we are wanting to have our own positions respected and understood if we aren't prepared to give that same degree of respect and understanding to others. Thank you. And question four has been withdrawn, so I call Mr David Michael Veen. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I too want to pay tribute to the First Minister and to the four faithful decades of service that he has given uh, to this province of ours. Um, I have no hesitancy in saying that whenever uh, books are being written about Mr. Robinson. Many of his critics will be lucky to get a footnote. And uh, I uh, want to pay tribute to him in the strongest possible terms and wish him every blessing for his retirement. Uh, I'm sure the First Minister, in his many years of service, has become accustomed to naysayers, uh, even whenever something uh, is actually very good that is on the table. Uh, I wonder, in that context, uh, would the First Minister um, believe and agree with me that uh, last week's agreement really does represent uh, a fresh start at Stormont. Well, can I thank uh, my friend for his uh, remarks? And yes, uh, there will always be people who uh, have uh, genuine misgivings uh, about uh, agreements that are, are reached, uh, and there will be those who had decided before agreement was ever reached that they had misgivings uh, about it. And uh, we already had some of the references being made before the uh, agreement was even written. Uh, about uh, how unacceptable it was. Uh, however, I think it is worth uh, pointing out that uh, in, in terms of uh, those people, ultimately the electorate in Northern Ireland will judge uh, whether it wants to have uh, wreckers uh, who are going to decide the future of Northern Ireland or it wants to invest its future in the hands of those who genuinely are wanting to make a fist of the most difficult circumstances and to try and move uh, Northern Ireland forward. I believe we have done that in the agreement that has been reached. It hasn't uh, ducked uh, very critical uh, issues that were causing this uh, Assembly and the uh, Executive to collapse. It has dealt with the issues of welfare reform, paramilitarism. We have dealt with our, our budgetary, uh, budgetary uh, issues. We have ways to improve the way the Assembly and the Executive uh, functions. Uh, and uh, there are issues that have still to be resolved, and we haven't uh, tried to, to hide that. But even on those, we made progress. Uh, and I hope uh, in, in time to come, we can make further progress still. Thank you. And Mr. McLevine for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the First Minister uh, for his answer. Uh, the, minister, the First Minister did touch on the issue of uh, paramilitary activity. Uh, would the fir First Minister agree with me that the provisions within the Stormont Agreement um, offer perhaps the most comprehensive package of measures ever uh, to deal with paramil paramilitary activity in our province? 
Well, they do, unquestionably do, and I don't think anybody could uh, take away from that uh, fact. Uh, and what I find uh, most uh, positive uh, about the section on uh, paramilitarism is that uh, we have uh, agreements, I think, that uh, everybody in this House can sign up to. Uh, and it's about standing together against paramilitarism uh, in all of its uh, emanations. Uh, it's about uh, having principles that we are all agreed uh, on, and there are a set of principles set down there which are not just going to be principles that uh, ministers have to take when going into to office, though it will be part of the, the Ministerial Code's Pledge of Office, but also for every member of the uh, Assembly to take. Uh, there are key actions. You will have uh, a task force that will take the drive against uh, paramilitary uh, criminality. You will have a strategy being brought forward by a panel uh, for the total disbandment and the end of all of the structures of paramilitary organizations. You have a monitoring and assessment body that will be able to look at the progress that is being made. And you have the very considerable resources being made available, which I referred to uh, earlier, uh, which will help it uh, for doing the task that uh, it has to, to undertake. So that whole range of issues, uh, I think, shows that uh, with uh, goodwill, with all of the parties in this House, we can really make uh, progress and I trust uh, have the, the end of paramilitarism in Northern Ireland once and for all. And thank you. And I call Ms Joanne Dobson. And I'm afraid we only have, question, we have time for your question, not a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I ask the First Minister if he still supports the campaign to bring a soft opt-out organ donation system to Northern Ireland? Mr uh, Speaker, uh, I think the, the, the member knows my, my view on wanting to drive up the number of people who are willing to donate uh, organs uh, in our society. The minister, I think, has already answered uh, for the department in that uh, matter. Uh, there is a, a letter from clinicians, and uh, I am very much uh, aware that uh, there are dangers when politicians try and tell the medical professionals what is best in their area. The outcome I want to see is more organ donation. Uh, I don't run away from the issues uh, in the, 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 the bill. Uh, there is some concern that the, the bill, as it is presently worded, may not have the outcomes that are being uh, suggested. Uh, whatever it does, I think it is incumbent upon all of us, uh, and I'm happy to, to leave my trust in the, the Health Minister in this respect, to ensure that we get the very best result for those who do need organs and have them available when they are needed. Uh, and I, I trust that whatever mechanism is used to, to bring that uh, about, it will have that outcome. Uh, thank you very much. And time is up. And best wishes, First Minister. Thank you very much.